Oh, like a like an honorary. Right, right. <laughs> I was I was sitting here like shaking my head. <laughs> All right, we uh, we we left off last time. Are we talking about accessibility? Yeah, really. It does seem like a long time. We, we talked about the notion of universal design and the basics of universal design are two. All right, and these two things, in a way, contradict each other, right? When you talk about simplicity, you're talking about bare bones. When you're talking about multiple presentations, you're talking about saying the same thing two different ways. In a way, that seems to contradict each other, and in a way, I guess it does, but that is the art of design, is finding the appropriate balance for any given situation between keeping things simple and providing options for people um, that have different ab abilities. All right. We went through a number of disabilities last time, and we talked about how people visiting the web, and we talked about some of the things under uh, multiple presentation that would um, assist um, folks with those issues. Pardon me? Okay. Uh, we talked about being possibly a factor. We talked about the thing of the letters being a factor, the white space between the letters being a factor. We talked about the use of images along with the text as being a factor. control issues and for that we talked about things such as making sure the targets for links are big enough. Don't have it that where you, you know, the link is just a very tiny thing to press on. Now again, to sort of reinforce this notion, when you get to mobile devices, that becomes a really big issue as well, right? You don't know how many times I've clicked like six different links with my finger when I go to click on something on a web page simply because the link targets are too small. So in that regard, again, it's something that you can do for accessibility reasons, but it just makes good design sense to do it anyhow, especially when you consider uh, mobile devices. things such as gratuitous animations that, especially things that flash, especially things that have no purpose. The nice thing is, is that some of these things are going away, all right? In other words, if we were teaching this class in, say, you know, 1998, all right, flaming logos would have been a huge issue, all right? Because that's people people found that they could do it and thought, wow, this is pretty cool. I'm going to do it. And that's exactly why people do it, because it is fun to do. It really is. I did a presentation on accessibility for faculty members once, 
And I did a PowerPoint presentation, which is probably the last PowerPoint presentation I'll ever do, because I, I, I simply refuse to do them anymore. Back in those days, you know, I, I kind of thought I had to, and, and now I realize, well, I, you know, if I don't do it, I don't have to, you know. But at any rate, I did one slide with a, to demonstrate like a flaming logo and say how bad it is and all that. I spent more time on that one slide than I did on the rest of the presentation, because it was a blast. What if we made the flames just a little bit bigger? What if we made the flames orange and yellow instead of red and yellow? You know, it, it's great fun to do, and that's why people do them. Thankfully, most people have gotten the clue on that. But, most, right. And we, we want to make sure that we avoid these things. And again, these are things that are not just, they're things that are damaging for people with epilepsy. They're things that are distracting for people with ADHD. They're things that are distracting slash annoying for people that don't even have these conditions. So, and they don't add any value to the page. They um, take longer to download. Again, faster download speed still, under some conditions, takes longer to download. And so, we have the actions really is sort of and multiple, um, I'm sorry, uh, hearing impaired. Yeah, exactly. Advi. Uh, impaired. Hearing impaired, uh, do again is you can have a, uh, a transcript along with any audio files that you have. You can close caption your videos. You can, um, you can have a transcript of, of any video that you have. And as I mentioned before, that sometimes is beneficial for people even that aren't deaf. If you're in the lab where there's no speakers on the computer and you forgot your headphones, you might still want to read an article. Or the example I gave last time of me liking to skim articles to see if it's something I'm really interested in. Um, I can do that quicker than I can watch a video. We also talked about the reason for um, sometimes that they force the videos, the videos I think are to force you to watch their ads. So there's other factors going here. We, be, me being a college professor, can afford to take the high road and, and be theoretical and say that you should provide uh, the two methods um, for accessing that. Blind talked about that. The one thing we did not talk about is color blindness. What can you do to help people that are color blind access your page? Alter the color scheme, right? That's actually a third issue or a third technique for dealing with these things. user configurability. And again, the one thing I want to emphasize for this is you get this, you get the ability to configure the appearance of the page if you follow a good separation of CSS and HTML. Okay? So that definitely is one choice. What else can you do? Pick a good contrasting color scheme. You know, not like, you know, orange on a yellow background or something like that. So a good contrasting um, um, color scheme. What do you do? You, you know, you, you said make it black and white only, and, I, and I'm not sure if you were joking or if you were serious about that, but you know, if you ain't got a better idea, black text, I background is never a bad choice. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's kind of like, you know, don't, um, how do I want to say, don't, don't force yourself to be clever and come up with some great color scheme when, you know what, the old-fashioned basic works the best, all right? So, yeah, that, that's not a bad choice. But we use color for a lot of things. We don't just use color to make our pages look pretty, right? We talk about using color to emphasize things, to draw attention, to group things maybe, 
to let people know that maybe one piece of text is a little bit different than the rest of the text on the page? Are we saying not to use color in those situations? No. What could we do then? Let's say I had a black text that was like a warning. You know, like those ominous warnings on pre prescription drugs. You know, you, you know, if you take this, you know, these 85 things might happen to you. And all of them are worse than the thing that you're being treated for, right? You know, so what a case like that. If you wanted to uh, style a warning to make it stand out page, what could you do as far as color goes? Pardon me? Okay. You could, you could, again, contrasting colors is, is a safe bet. What else could you do? Okay. Exactly. You could designate the special meaning in another way. All right. You mentioned by having a graphic that was like to draw attention. You could put a word around it. You could have it in a different font. You could have it in a bigger font. All right? You could have it in bold. All right? All things are secondary ways. They fall under the category of multiple presentation. A secondary way that you can designate something as being different beyond just using color. All right? So, you have a warning that is important for people to read. So you put it in red text, all right? You could also make the text bold, make it a different font, make it a bigger font. You're presenting that information, the information being this is special text, in two different ways. Uh, sort of bothered me, I had, I had a real smart alecky student several years back. That said, that that said that web accessibility was just was was like political correctness, you know, because some people can't see videos, don't have any videos on your site to make it accessible, and that person missed the point completely, because no one said not do these things if they've truly added value to the page. All right, the idea is figuring out a way using multiple presentations to get the idea across. If the person can't see the video, find a second way to present it. All right? If the person can't see the color, that doesn't mean don't use colors, because most people can see colors. All right? But figure out a second way to do it. So if I have red, bold text to indicate a warning, people that are colorblind will see, hey, that text is bold. There's something different about it. People that aren't colorblind will see that it's red and bold. They'll get two signals that there's something different about it. So what? You know, it's not like it's going to, they're, they're going to say, well, that cancels each other out. I guess it's not important then because it's red and bold. They'll still understand that there's something different and special about that text. So by the technique of multiple presentation, we're not saying ever, I don't think I've ever said, to eliminate something from a page that adds value to the page. The only cases where I said to eliminate stuff from the page are things like gratuitous animation that really don't add anything to the page anyhow. All right? I don't know how to answer it. <laughs> So, this isn't about getting rid of content from your site or, or dumbing down your site or suppressing your creativity. It's about challenging you to use your creativity to find a solution that works for as many different people and in as many different circumstances as possible. And again, doing that in a way where you're not creating a giant mess of millions of things on a page, keeping in mind the simplicity effect. All right? So figure out a way that you can tell your story with text and images, but it still looks good and it's still simple and it's still straightforward. All right? 
Now, there's some specific things that we're going to learn about accessibility in the upcoming weeks. All right? As we talk about forms, for example. Forms allow users to enter stuff in. So there's some specific things that we're going to talk about with forms. There's some specific things that we're going to talk about that uh, with regards to tables, when we talk about tables. All right? So from here on in, when we talk about something, if there's an accessibility implication, we'll talk about it just as part of it. We'll say, well, this is what you do, but to make it more accessible, this is what you do in addition to it. Now, there are a number of tools that you can use to test your page for accessibility. There's actually a colorblind uh, page. And again, I, I'm not, I can't recall if I showed this or not in class. But oh, okay. All right. Yeah. There's a color blindness filter. Color blindness test. Oh, this is for an individual. Color blindness. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. That was, that was. Oh, really? Oh, no, I have not. Really? Right. 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 And, and again, yeah, I mean, that, that is one thing to recall that, you know, I've been saying color blindness um, as though that's one condition. Whereas uh, color blindness, um, there, there's, there's multiple kinds of color uh, blindness depending on depending on um, an individual, they may have one or, or more than one. Well, they wouldn't have more than one, but, but a group of individuals might have, um, you know, well, multiple. Um, Here's a simple one. It doesn't really, you know, if you see monochromatic, that's how you'll see the colors. If you have this kind, that's how you'll see the colors. If there's no redness, if there's no greenness, that's how you'll see them, and so on. Um... Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I think actually what you're seeing is you're seeing um, a, a, a shade of green where it says no blue. Right. I, re I remember I was a little kid that thought, what if every person saw red differently? What if what I think is red, you think is... Yeah, yeah, and then it's like, why? You know, I, I was a strange little kid. And it, yeah, and that, that, disturbed them. That, that disturbed me for a long time. What if, well, if you're red, it, my red is what you would call green. Yeah, exactly. It's like, wow. Yeah, it, it, is, it is crazy. Oh, that is, you know, believe it or not, that it, it, is, it is called Synthanasia. Synthanasia. I, I actually, um, over spring break, I actually participated in a conference on Synthanasia, a symposium, uh, with, with uh, uh, I, I do just as a, as for, for giggles, I do some like generative music and generative art. And where I have imagery, images uh, that go along with music, and they're like generated. And I had a little video piece that was included in that. But so yeah, I was involved in that at Oberlin. That was kind of fun. But yeah, synth synthanasia. That sounds really good for like me to put on my annual evaluation. 
even though it was just like some code that I, I put together for laughs while I was watching, um, you know, uh, Bob's Burgers on TV <laughs> late, late one night, you know. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah, it, 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 was, it was a lot of fun. And it was amazing to see what other people did as well with that, yeah. All right. Questions about this? And we'll, co we'll come back to this again. Um, I really wish, um, one thing that I, I say every semester, but unfortunately it falls by the, um, the wayside, is it would be great for me to set up a computer in the lab and do as was suggested, disconnect the monitor, disconnect the mouse, right? Blind people can't use the mice, mouse, right? So, so how do they move around the screen? Well, they tab, all right? They, yeah. <laughs> They, they, uh, yeah, they move around that way. But that would really give you the experience. Could you do an Excel spreadsheet doing that? Could you do, uh, could you navigate? Could you Google and search for um, something, you know? Um, that is very weird to think about. <laughs> well, well, again, you know, uh, I, I, I mentioned a story. It was amazing to see the high school student that, that, was, that I share an office with um, just do everything that you would with the, the room completely black, all right, because she wouldn't turn the light on. Well, you know, why would you turn the light on if you can't see, you know? Uh, I, I mean, it, I, I don't mean I don't mean to make light of it, but it was just, it, pardon the pun, make light of it, but... Uh, <laughs> But, but it was weird, like me coming in in the morning, room completely dark, turn it on, there she is sitting there, blank screen, type it away, you know. Um, but, but again, she, she did things, she created PowerPoint presentations, she surfed the web, and so on. It is, is really, really, uh, how do you surf the web? Well, well I, was, I was amazed... I was amazed um, that she could find her way around NASA Glenn's campus, right? I mean, I can see and I can't, I can't find my way around there. It's, very, it's a big place and it, there's a lot of buildings and, you know, it can be confusing. And, and yet, she was able to navigate her way around there, you know, and all that. It, it was funny, too. Um, oh, what was... Oh, the, her, her mentor, who was, who was also blind... Um, had on her had on her door, cadet, and then had her name, and I can't recall her name anymore. But it was cadet, and then I'm thinking like, oh, cadet. She must be like a cadet in I don't know what what you're a cadet in, you know, and all that. As it turned out, cadet was the name of her seeing eye dog. So, <laughs> yeah, they had they had his name, his or her name up there as well. So, all right. So we'll co keep coming back to this. Next week is an auspicious week. Why is it an auspicious week? What does auspicious mean, anyhow? <laughs> Given or being a sign of future success. Favorable, propitious, promising. Rosy, good, encouraging. It's an auspicious week. It is an auspicious week because next week your design is due. Yeah. <laughs> and if you do a good job on the design, there's a good chance you will do a good job on your project. Now, this is something I know that people don't like to do. And I know people put it off. And I know there's people that probably have finished the HTML for their site already. And, well, all right, maybe. In the past, there have been people that have finished the HTML for the site and are going back now to retrofit the design for it. All right? Let me tell you, again, don't underestimate the idea of a design, all right? Let's, let's refresh our memory what I mean by a design, because when I describe web design, I take a little bit different perspective, and the focus is on the content and the functionality as opposed to the appearance. 
The appearance is just sort of one, one component that sort of comes in late in the game. All right. In a design, you're identifying your likely users, defining some characteristics of them, and defining what their goals are. You're also defining the goals of the organization. That is the strategy section. Why am I making this website? And again, people collectively have gotten better on web design. But back in the old days, people made websites as a sort of corporate peer pressure. All right? All these other companies have a website. You could almost picture the head of IT going to the CEO saying, we need money for a website. And the CEO saying, we, we don't have money for that. And the IT director say, but every other company has a website. I want one too. And they would do it. All right? And they would do it because they knew that the web was important, but they didn't necessarily think through exactly how they could take advantage of it, exactly why it was important for their particular organization. So we put that right up front. That's the strategy section. The scope section is where we look and we say, well, these are the goals we want to accomplish. What are we going to put on our site to help us achieve these goals? If we're a band and we want to get new audience, what are some things we can do to attract new audience members, you know, new, new people, new fans? All right. Again, there should be a correspondence between the two. Every goal that you have should be addressed by one of the items in the scope section, at least one. Every item in your scope section should map back to a goal. If you have a goal and there's nothing that you're putting on your site to address that goal, then you've missed the boat. You've identified this as one of the most important and you're not going to do anything to address The reverse is also true. If you have something that you say you're going to put on your site, but it doesn't really address any of the goals, why do you need it? Get rid of it. It's just clutter. All right? Simplicity. Remember, everything that you put on your site has the potential to distract people from other stuff on your site. So if it's not important, don't put it there. All right. Now here's where here's the artfulness of the best web designers. Because you might look and say a good portion of our users don't care about this information, but there's going to be some that do. To figure out a way to still have stuff on your site that doesn't get away with your typical user, but the sort of edge case user can still find it. That's artful to, to have a, a design that is handles the needs of most of the people in a very straightforward, simple way, but also provides sort of your extreme users, for lack of a better word, some of the content that they may need. All right, that's you know that's that's an art, and that's that's something. Um, um, that, 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 you know, only experience will take. I used to have a good definition for software, what constitutes good software, at least partially what constitutes good software. And I said good software makes the things that you want to do most often easy to do. All right? So, for example, you know, if you look at Microsoft Word or Excel or, or any of those, what are the things I'm going to do most often? You know, I'm going to write a memo, I'm going to write a letter, and all that. Now, the interesting thing is, in my opinion, software like Microsoft Word, the people that created it went feature crazy. They treated all features as being equal. So the thing that you want to do one out of a thousand times is just as easy to do as the thing that you want to do 50% of the time. And in my mind, that's not well designed. All right? Now, I did hear someone that had a better definition of software. They, they, I, I would say they took my definition like they really heard what I said, you know. 
but they, they sort of extended the concept to say it makes the common things easy to do and makes less common things possible. All right, so well-designed software, the things that you're doing all the time ought to be really easy. But you know what? Those rare things, I'm making a newsletter that is going to be printed sideways and I want six columns on it. Yeah, you should be able to do that, provided you dig hard enough in Microsoft Word. And again, all things aren't equal as far as content on a website. There's the, the things that most people are most interested in, then there's other stuff. And a good designer can figure out a way to present both of those things. The next phase, again to remind you, is the, um, I'm sorry, not the skeleton phase, the structure phase. And the structure phase is where you sort of set up the hierarchy of your site. How you're dividing the content on a different page. And the one thing that we talked about is that any topic that you want, you could choose to divide it in multiple different ways. For example, let's say we're doing a site about web development. All right. We could have a section of our site about HTML and a section about CSS. That would be one logical, reasonable way to develop it. All right. Or I could say, here is a section about placing text on my page and show the HTML tags and the CSS used for manipulating text. Here is um, a, a section of my site about how to structure my site into different sections, the nav section and the header section and all that. And I could show HTML and CSS for that. Both of those are logical. All right. Both of those are completely logical, completely reasonable. All right. Your job as a designer is to figure out which one of those schemes or some other scheme is best for your users. All right. Larger organizations actually will mock up and do some user testing uh, with that. Um, at, at NASA, they were reworking their intranet site when I was there. And as you imagine, a government agency has like a billion different forms that their employees can fill out, like request for vacation, request for travel expenses, you know, and then, you know, 999 million others, right? And therefore, finding the forms is difficult. So what they did is they developed a couple of schemes. And they actually brought users in, just ordinary folks, and said, so imagine you wanted, to, uh, you wanted to request vacation. Find the vacation form on this page. Find the vacation form on that page. And they'd keep track and they'd say, well, this one they found by clicking two things. This one it took them ten things to click and go backwards and click forward and backwards and so on. So you can actually perform those sort of tests for a larger organization. On smaller projects, you don't necessarily have the budget or the means to do those. All right. But that's where empathy as a designer comes in, and that's where the ability to put yourself in other people's shoes comes in. A classic example of that is organizations that divide their content based on how the organization is structured as opposed to based to how the users see the organization. I'll give a classic example, and not to pick on anyone, a college. All right? A college. How is a college divided? The college is divided into divisions, right? We have allied health, we have engineering, business, and information technology, one division. We have arts and sciences, we have so on and so forth. We know, because we work at the college, what degree programs are in each of those sections. Someone coming in from the outside world, they're not going to have any idea. Someone coming from the outside world that wants to study computer gaming, for example, where do you look? Actually, it's in the science and math area, I think. All right, here, I work here and I don't even know, right? But you might reasonably think that it's in engineering and and you might, if you didn't see it in that section, you might think that they didn't have one. All right. 
again, the better way to approach it is to approach it from how your users are going to see it. All right, so that's the structure where you lay out, almost looks like an organization chart, but it's for web pages. And you define what content is going to be on what pages. You then have the um, skeleton phase where you draw what a page is going to look like, but just in big blocks. Here's a header, here's a navigation, here's a footer, here's a content area, here's a sidebar, and so on. Then finally you develop a prototype. And a prototype doesn't have to be complete, that's what I call it a prototype. But it's a model and you should be able to show it to someone and give them a reasonable sense of what your plans are for how the page is going to look and act. Now, people ask me that all the time. How much do I need to do for a prototype? Does a prototype need to be finished? No, it doesn't need to be finished. In fact, if it was a finished page, you probably spent too much time working on it, right? Because the idea of a prototype is you want to actually show something, show a final product up to someone, and have them give you feedback and say, no, I don't like this. Yes, I like this. No, this shouldn't be here at all. Hey, you forgot this. So if you spend too much time polishing your prototype to make it look, uh, perfect, then, um, then you know, you, you've wasted time because people are going to criticize it anyhow. On the other hand, if your prototype is just like something we would have done the first week in classes where really no effort was taken for it, you're not giving people a sense of what your page is going to look like. All right? Remember why you create a design. All right? You create a design for two main reasons. Reason number one is to sort of formulate your own thoughts and come up a plan with what you're going to do. All right? This is just, you know, in, in any discipline you talk about, this is recommended. If you're going to do an experiment in science, you plan what sort of experiment you're going to do. Right? If you're going to write a paper, you outline the paper first. All right? In any discipline, there's a planning stage. If you're going to take a trip, you don't just jump in your car one day and start driving. You plan that trip. All right? So you're going to get better results if you take the time to do some sort of plan. Just get your thoughts down and put them down on paper because that's sort of a concrete way as opposed to yeah, I think I know how to do this. Well, let's see it on paper. That'll show if you really have thought it through or not. Now, a plan is not meant to be ironclad. You know, you plan a trip to go from here to Cincinnati, and you find that there's a road that's closed. Well, you have to deviate from the plan. But it's still better than shooting from the hip and, well, Cincinnati, I think, is south from here, so I'm going to start driving south. All right? The other reason that you create a design is to communicate to other people. Typically, you're developing websites for someone else, whether it be someone in your organization or if you're working as a consultant, someone that's hired you. All right? And you want to show them what your plans are before you do it. I think there's a graph I've shown in this class. If I have, I'll show it again because it's important. If not, then I definitely need to show it. But this graph shows the cost of making a change compared to the phase of the project that you find it in. Planning, building, implementing, maintenance. So if you it's relatively inexpensive to correct it. If you plan it while writing it, well, it's a little more expensive, but it's not that bad. If you've already implemented it, or your site's out there and you're, making, you're maintaining it, and the site has been in use for a while, then the cost to make the change goes up. This is true for any kind of software, by the way. This isn't just a web page thing. So if you're talking about mainframe programming, if you're talking about mobile development, if you're talking about any of these things, this is, how, this is how it's been since day one of software, and this is how it will be 
until the Terminators take over, right? This is how it's going to be forever, all right? This car. Again, a good analogy to think of is building a house. If you decide that you want a window in a room, well that, win well, that room is still a sketch on paper, doesn't cost you much to add that window as opposed to when you're living in the house, all right? Or add a room or add a bathroom or whatever. To make a change after you're living in the house is much more expensive to make it when you're planning it. All right? And again, because you want to communicate to other people what your plans are so that they can look at it and say, yeah, you're on the right track or no, you're not on the right track. And you have to sort of develop a thick skin because if they rip your design apart, at least you're getting to the right answer. At least you're getting to something that serves your needs. This is a fascinating topic. Those of you that are CISS majors, you'll take a system development class where you talk about this um, topic. One thing that's important, to you, though, is to bring your own knowledge to the, to the table. Um, there's two, the two biggest problems, one of them is not listening to your users, and the second is probably listening to your users. All right? Another When you, as you gain experience, you have to share. So if your user looks that page is too boring, I look that gap in the middle of the page uh, is your to use your not to get the right direction. All right to put quite as good of an idea as they may think, and to maybe suggest some alternatives. All right? Maybe you take their, um, maybe you take their, what they can read between the lines, and say, okay, you know, you want to add, interest to the page, suggest alternatives, all right, to something that is clearly not right. Exactly. Does they pick their topic for their site? Now, you're most of the way done with the design. You're going to wrap yeah, to turn it in, you know. So, yeah. The perception of the instructor. What, 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 it might be good for those of you that are struggling with the topic to hear some of the other choices. Zero. zero. What about zero? Oh, zero. Okay. The history of zero. There's actually, I did not read the book, but I actually saw that there was a book about that. And it cracked me up that, like, for the longest time, there was no, like, number zero, and someone, like, invented it. Like, yeah, we're just going to, yeah. Well, what happens if you have one and you get rid of it? I don't know. And then someone one day is like, well, you got zero of them, you know. So that, that, is, a, that is a good topic. Uh, who would your audience be for that? Okay. Nerds, kids in school, people that are interested in math. All right. Um, I will say, and, and again, uh, um, please hear this the right way, that's a site that it wouldn't appeal to every person. Yeah, a lot of people aren't going to look and say, wow, zero. It, 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 a lot of people are going to like say, zero, always, yeah, it's like, what? Yeah, we've always had zero, next site. But, so you don't even try to go for those people. You go for the people that you think, would like it, yeah, yeah, or need it, right, right. Anyone else? Topic? Something on music? All right. The, 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 the thing with that, again, the thing that I, uh, on music or drumming, the thing about that is I would be careful in, in sort of limiting the scope, all right, because 
music obviously is a gigantic. I actually saw someone had an interactive graphic of every musical genre. So there's like 50, 50 variations of heavy metal. You know, whether it's, it's death metal or thrash death metal or whatever. So, <laughs> uh, so at any rate, yeah, so when you're talking about that, I want to limit it. Drumming is a good step in limiting that. Even that would be um, fairly broad and, and, again, consider the audience. Is it for musicians versus the general public and so on? Anyone else? World, are, are you serious? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Every yeah every year, every year I, I get students that do it on the Warcraft, what it would just, what League of Legends or something like that. Okay. All right. And. And generally, generally speaking, that's a good topic, all right? It, it's like the right size, you know? And uh, again, the one thing that you'd have to be, be aware of is who you're writing this for and what's your audience. Are you writing this for people that, you know, um, um, a lot of students have done it for like, like a web page for their guild, whatever that is, all right? And that's going to be different than if you write it for the average Joe that doesn't know anything about it. Pardon me? Exactly. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Anyone else? Planners? Planners with a T or with an N? Okay. Really? <laughs> okay. The meta planning. Wow. 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 I my. It, yeah, this is, this is one of the reasons that this is typically among my class, is just seeing like what people do for their pages and projects is like stuff that I didn't even know existed. And I know what those are, right? And, uh, you know, so, yeah, but, but like a planning community. I thought you like meant, when you first said it, I thought you like meant planners, like you put, you put flowers in or something. Yeah, wow. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that... I see what I'm doing during lab today. <laughs> wow. That is, some, that is something I probably could use some help with. I actually had a text document on my computer that I lost, so I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing this week. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so I kind of know, but yeah, I do. I do. I had to be here for something today at eleven, but you know, other than that, yeah, yeah. Oh, comments, other problem points. Keep in mind that for the rest of the semester, this is like, in a way, this is kind of like job one. You know, we're gonna have other lab assignments, but this is one. You know, you want to do a great job. You want to take everything you've learned, both about the and specific HTML. Remember, CSS something that you've thought up in a good design. 
So getting this done right is, is important. So lab time, lecture time, I'll be more than happy to take time to discuss and answer your questions about your project as the semester goes on. Or, or via email if you're taking the online class. Or via Skype if you're taking the, the online class. <laughs> Telegram, yeah, sure, why not? Morse code, yeah. All right, well, we'll see you, uh, we'll see you up in lab.